Uh, good evening, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. How is it? Yes, sir. Uh, clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we'll wait sir, another for uh, three, four minutes. Sure.
Shall we start, sir? Uh, sir, you are on mute. Uh, yes, sir, now it's fine. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. So, can we, shall we start, sir? Yeah, we can go ahead, yeah. Sure, sir. So, go, hi, good evening, everyone. And uh, welcome to Essentials of Cardiac Basic course. So we have already covered two sessions previously on uh, basic pacemaker concepts and uh, pacemaker timing cycles. So today is the third session on common pacemaker algorithms. And uh, our course director is uh, Dr. Kumar Nananan, who is a senior electrophysiologist in Medicover Hospital, Hyderabad. So just one ground rule, please everyone mute your lines and uh, we will be taking all the questions through chat, chat box. Over to you, sir. You can start, sir, now. Thank you, Kashif. So I hope I'm uh, my uh, audio is clear. So now this is the third session which we are, are doing uh, on the essentials of uh, cardiac pacing. So this uh, session today, we are going to talk about some of the essential and common pacemaker algorithms, which are very frequently encountered. So these algorithms, it's important for all of you to have a working knowledge of it, because you're going to encounter these very frequently on the uh, pacemaker programming screen. And then you're going to hear people talking about it uh, saying that the auto capture threshold is this much, or, you know, the patient went into mode switch several times and things like this, where you should not uh, be unfamiliar with what is happening. And secondly, if you uh, encounter certain behaviors of the pacemaker, then you should be able to understand what's going on. So we'll begin with a illustrative case example of this. And uh, this is an I encountered it was a 65-year-old male who had been implanted with a single-chamber VVI pacemaker for complete heart block, and the lower rate limit was set at 70 beats per minute. So you will recall from our first session that the lower rate limit is that below which the pacemaker will deliver pacing. In other words, it will not allow the rate to fall below the lower rate limit. So this person implanted with his VVI pacemaker went for a regular checkup with his cardiologist and the ECG and found out that the heart rate was uh, only 62 with the patient's own rhythm in AV block, but there was no pacing seen, absolutely. So he was very concerned and uh, he called me saying that I don't think the pacemaker is working and there is something wrong. So was it truly that the pacemaker wasn't working or was there some algorithm at play? So it turned out that this person, this pacemaker had hysteresis programmed on and this, what we were encountering was a completely normal behavior for the programming which was done. So this is a very simple uh, knowledge which uh, is necessary. You no know, unnecessary panic or uh, unnecessary interventions if you are not aware of that. So we, We'll talk about the various commonly encountered algorithms. Uh, so why do we have these various kinds of algorithms? They have different types of functions. Some are designed to enhance safety, such as the auto capture algorithm, or to overcome some other problems which can interfere with a smooth uh, rhythm management. Some of them, as we will see, those which are designed to minimize ventricular pacing are designed to provide more physiologic pacing. Some of them help to conserve battery life. Now, in many of these algorithms, there are programmable features. So unless you're familiar with what the algorithm is and what it is, able to make the best use of them. And also, as we just pointed out, we should not mistake an abnormal algorithm function for a pacemaker malfunction. Let's now go individually for certain commonly used algorithms. The first one which I want to talk about is capture management. This is often abbreviated as auto capture. Now, currently most or all of the companies, uh, pacemaker companies have automatic capture management with certain variations in the, uh, in the fine 
of it. But in essence, all of them are basically algorithms which automatically detect myocardial capture. So whether it's in the ventricle or whether it's in the atrium, the pacemaker not only paces, but it's also able to detect and find out if that pacing captured the myocardium or not. So what is the benefit of that? It basically helps you program just a minimum margin of safety. Remember again in the first session when we talked about threshold, we talked about the fact that you need to give a sufficient margin of safety for the threshold. So suppose you had uh, a pacing threshold of 1.5 volts, we said that typically you would want to program at least double that value, 3 or 3.5 volts. So that is a good margin of safety, but on the other hand, if you see you're using twice the energy which you actually have to use, and in the long run, it's not the most efficient way of utilizing the battery. So is there a way to balance both the safety and the efficacy as well, or the battery efficiency? And that is where auto capture becomes very important. What is the underlying principle of this? The principle is that the pacemaker tries to detect myocardial capture using the evoked electrogram or the evoked response. So in the first session, we talked about how the device senses. So you have a lead in contact with the myocardium. And as the intrinsic wave of depolarization passes around the lead, it in inscribes a electrical signal which is detected by the lead and then passed on to the pacemaker and the pacemaker is able to say that an intrinsic event has occurred. So this is simple enough when this is the patient's own intrinsic rhythm. The patient has his own intrinsic RV. Now this becomes slightly complex when you have to detect it in a paced beat. Now why is that? Because the pacemaker is first delivering a high voltage impulse. Remember, myocardial depolarization is in the order of millivolts. So if you measure an R wave in the cath lab and you're implanting a pacemaker, you might find it to be 5 millivolts or 8 millivolts or 10 millivolts. Now in contrast, the pacing spike which is delivered is several times of a higher magnitude, it's in volts. So your output is either 1 volt or 2 volt or 2.5 volts and so forth. So you have a large pacing spike which is then followed by the intrinsic capture, the depolarization, which is happening in the myocardium. So therefore, if you look at this top panel here, that is your pace polarization artifact, the big electrical impulse, which has been delivered by the pacemaker. Then you have the evoked response, which is the electrical signal from the myocardial depolarization. And finally, in the third panel, you can see the combined result which the pacemaker actually sees. You are seeing a combination of a pacing polarization plus the myocardial response, and that is the hybrid signal, which is the step is for the pacemaker to be able to decide that I am able to discern sufficiently the signal to confidently recommend auto capture, which is why if you look at any auto capture algorithm, there will be a step first where it says, it asks you to run the auto capture program, and then it gives you a message saying whether auto capture recommended or not. So how does it do that? It basically determines the evoked response gain and sensitivity levels by delivering five paired pulses. So if you look at the way the auto capture initial uh, phase runs, you will find paired impulses, two impulses being delivered. First impulse, which will capture the myocardium, will determine or measure the combined evoked response, which we just saw in the previous slide. It then delivers a second pulse, typically within 100 milliseconds of the first pulse. Now, what is that pulse going to do? It is not going to be able to capture the myocardium because it's going to fall within the refractory period. You just now captured the myocardium. And therefore, the second pulse will be a pure pace polarization pulse alone. So then the device is able to compare the response of the first pulse, where you have the combined response, 
versus the second pulse, which is a pure phase polarization, and then see if it has an adequate sensitivity to make out a difference between the two. So if it achieves this adequate margin of safety, then it recommends auto capture. Another important point is that when you're doing auto capture testing, you must pace sufficiently fast to achieve full myocardial capture. So if the patient's own heart rate is 90, you must pace at 100 or 110. This is important because you don't want fusion with the to then result in a different set of parameters only paced to them. And nowadays, most modern pacemakers also incorporate this safety net because if it detects fusion with intrinsic depolarization, then it is going to not recommend auto capture and, and probably give you a message saying that there is fusion. And therefore, at this point, I will not recommend auto capture. So sometimes when you see such, such a message, if you repeat your auto capture uh, testing with a little higher rate, you may be able to then get a favorable result of the auto capture being recommended. So this is as far as recommending auto capture by the device goes. So this is again a visual representation of that. So as soon as the pacing spike is delivered, just like you have a, a blanking for the timing cycles, even to detect the evoked response in order to ignore the initial massive paced voltage, it has a very short blanking period. And then it has an evoked response detection window where it detects the intrinsic myocardial depolarization as a result of pacing. And when it has a sufficient margin of safety, it recommends uh, switching on of the auto capture. Let's see how it works. So the device first determines the pacing threshold for that particular chamber. The threshold is determined, let us say it's 0.75 or 1 or 1.25 or whatever. Then it sets its output with just a minimal margin of safety. 0.25 volts the ventricle, and then it just gives that margin of safety and it paces at that. Now remember, with every pacing, it is ensuring or it's detecting myocardial capture. If there is loss of capture at any point of time. What it does is it immediately gives a backup pulse at a pretty high output, for example, five volts, so that there is no drop beat. The myocardium will get captured. So if it was pacing at one volt and it had a loss of capture in one beat, it's going to immediately give a backup. The next beat, it's going to deliver with a little increment in output, say 1.25 volts. And then if the capture is established, then it goes with this new output of 1.25 volts. On the other hand, if you have two successive loss of captures, it runs the threshold test all over again, determines what the threshold is now, and then again sets a small margin of safety above it, and then goes ahead in that way. Now, the ideal auto capture algorithm should be doing this on a beat to beat basis. So that is a very reliable auto capture mechanism where you can confidently allow this minimal increment in output to be programmed. But you have to be careful and look at the way that auto capture algorithm works in that specific device. Because in some devices, there will be auto capture, but it will not be really doing it on a beat to beat basis. It will be doing something else like checking the threshold, say every two hours or every three hours and then automatically adjusting its output. Now in such devices, where there is no beat to beat capture management, you have to be careful and probably provide a little higher margin of safety. But in those devices where you truly have this kind of verification of capture in every beat, then a small margin of acceptable to uh, program the auto capture algorithm. So the two main advantages of auto capture are number one, safety. It avoids loss of capture due to fluctuation in threshold. See, remember, sometimes you can even have some large fluctuations of threshold due to various reasons. You might have determined a threshold of one, and then you have switched on auto capture. Let us say a few days down the line, something happened and the threshold went up to three. Even then, 
due, due to the detection of the loss of capture, the auto capture will then be able to go find out that the threshold is three and then start facing at 3.25 or 3.5. So number one, safety is uh, better with auto capture. And secondly, uh, the other important point is that you achieve battery efficiency because you just give that much output as necessary. All right. So we come to point number two, the algorithm number two, which we talked about in our case example, which is hysteresis. So what is hysteresis? Hysteresis is a program by which you can promote the patient's own intrinsic events rather than so why do you want to do that? Having put a pacemaker, why do you want to uh, look for intrinsic events? This is because whenever possible, you want to allow physiologic activation of the heart. We'll talk more about this in minimizing ventricular pacing, but we know that no matter whether it's atrium or the ventricle, the paced sequence of activation is always inferior in physiologic terms to the patient's own intrinsic activation. So you want now, intrinsic activation, if it is present, whenever possible. Secondly, again, if the patient has a good period of time where you don't need to pace, then again, you can conserve battery. So these are the two functions which a hysteresis algorithm can achieve. So what is the basic concept of hysteresis? The device allows a longer interval to elapse whenever an intrinsic event is detected. That is the basic principle of hysteresis. So therefore, if you program hysteresis on, then you will have another interval in addition to the lower rate interval. And this will be the hysteresis interval. And corresponding to that, there will be a hysteresis rate. So we said that the lower rate interval is an inviolable principle of the pacemaker. But the single exception to that is probably the hysteresis uh, interval programming hysteresis. There, there can be some other uh, more indirect ways also in some of the algorithms where the rate may fall below the lower rate interval, but we will not uh, go into those. Now. But you can, the, the direct example which you can remember, and the first thing you should think of whenever you see that a device is not pacing at the set lower rate, the first question you should ask is Has hysteresis been programmed? So, hysteresis three types, ventricular hysteresis, atrial hysteresis, and then AV hysteresis. So the first two are fairly easy to understand. So this is an example of ventricular hysteresis. So here, the lower rate has been programmed to 60 beats per minute, which means that if the rate falls to below 60, the pacemaker should pace. But in addition, a hysteresis rate has been programmed. Now remember, hysteresis rate is always going to be lower than your set programmed Rate. That is the extra leeway you want to allow to look for intrinsic events. So here in this example, if we take that the hysteresis rate has been set to 50 beats per minute, how does this practically operate? So the first beat is a paced beat. The pacemaker waits for the lower rate interval corresponding to 60 beats per minute, which is 1000 milliseconds. At the end of 1000 milliseconds, it's going to pace. Now, after this paced beat, what happened was that at 760 milliseconds, the patient had intrinsic R wave, his own activation. Now, as soon as the de device detected the intrinsic R wave, it said that I'm going to now switch to the hysteresis interval and not the lower rate interval. And therefore, it switched to the interval corresponding to 50 beats per minute, which is 1200 milliseconds. So here, it waited for 1200 milliseconds and when nothing happened, it then gave a pacing. Now, what's going to happen after this paced beat? It is again going to switch back to its lower rate interval because this is not an intrinsic event. On the other hand, suppose that you had another intrinsic event at 1100 milliseconds. Remember, 1100 is longer than your lower rate interval. But it is within the hysteresis interval. So you had an intrinsic depolarization here at 1100 milliseconds. Then again, it's going to wait for its hysteresis interval to elapse, 1200. So again, 
if after this the next beat was an intrinsic depolarization at 1100 and it kept continuing at 1100 1100 then you will have an intrinsic rhythm going on at 1100 milliseconds which is going to be slower than your lower rate as long as intrinsic events continue to occur the pacemaker will be guided by its hysteresis interval and hysteresis rate the moment there is no intrinsic rhythm and a paced beat comes it switches back to its lower rate interval so essentially when hysteresis is programmed it keeps switching back and forth depending on intrinsic events between the lower rate interval and the hysteresis interval the same thing is therefore as i said the hysteresis can violate the lower rate interval Atrial hysteresis is going to operate in the same way. Whenever you have the intrinsic uh, P wave occurring, it's going to wait for a longer duration. And only after the elapse of the hysteresis interval, it is going to give the next atrial pace. Now, the third concept, AV hysteresis, we will talk about as the algorithms to reduce RB pacing. Now again, these algorithms are going to common counter because every company with a dual chamber pacemaker has of an algorithm which you can use to reduce or minimize ventricular. So the pacemaker has come a full circle from initially being invented pace the ventricle and then now paradoxically saying that we have put a pacemaker but we, but we want to try and not pace the ventricle as much as possible and this has come about as a result of the realization that rv pacing is deleterious the normal activation of the ventricle through the his perkinji system is the most physiologic mechanism of activation it gives the most efficient pump function and again in the long term it has no adverse effects. Whereas if you artificially pace the RV, it creates LV dyssynchrony. And over a period of time, repetitive LV dyssynchrony can gradually lead to LV dysfunction. And this is known as pacing induced cardiomyopathy. Now in different studies, different extents of pacing induced cardiomyopathy up to 20% have been reported. So especially if the patient has intermittent periods of intrinsic conduction you want to try and allow that and not unnecessarily pace the rv if there are periods when the patient is conducting intrinsically so there are various different shades of algorithms with some nuances and variations in the way they operate but at the end of the day all of them incorporate one basic principle that is extend the AV delay. You have a particular programmed AV delay in a dual chamber pacemaker. We talked about it last time during the timing cycles. You have a sensed AV delay, you have a paced AV delay. So after an atrial event, the pacemaker is going to wait for a particular duration, which is your programmed AV delay, and then it is going to pace the ventricle. Now, if you keep it fixed, and if the patient can have Well, you will never come to know about it, facing it a fixed AV delay. So the concept of most of the algorithms to reduce ventricular pacing is to extend the AV delay to permit intrinsic conduction. And second aspect of this is that also search periodically for intrinsic conduction by periodically extending the AV delay. All right. So what are the different variations of this. So the number one, uh, one of the common algorithms which you'll encounter to minimize ventricular pacing is known as AV hysteresis. Now again, different companies have different proprietary names for this. So in a simple way, if you look at, it will be similar to atrial or ventricular hysteresis. So here, what will happen? After, if the patient has an intrinsic R wave, then in the next cycle, the pacemaker will allow for a longer AV interval than what you have programmed. And you can set a factor by which you want to extend the AV delay. And within this extended AV delay, 
if the r wave happens intrinsic r wave then the pacemaker continues with this extended av delay and it keeps happening as long as intrinsic conduction is there within that window however if there is no intrinsic conduction and v pacing happens then the extension of this av delay is suspended and it gets shortened back to its original value so that is simple av hysteresis and what is such av hysteresis here the pacemaker performs a search periodically by extending the av delay and again this is programmable in different ways you can say just extend the av delay by a fixed interval or you can say extend the av delay in increments extend it initially 30 milliseconds then extend it 60 milliseconds then extend it 80 milliseconds and so forth and you can set a maximal extension which you want to allow so here as the pacemaker is going in the dual chamber mode every regular period of time and that's one of the programs you want to search every few minutes every few hours or you want to search at increasing intervals all of these can be programmed now it keeps in that every few hours or so it keeps extending the av delay incrementally looking for the intrinsic conduction if it finds an intrinsic conduction then it notes that particular av delay and then allows intrinsic conduction to happen at that longer av delay and then it keeps allowing that as long as intrinsic conduction is there if intrinsic conduction fails then you go back to your programmed av delay so basically av hysteresis and search av hysteresis rely on extending av delays to search for intrinsic conduction and therefore avoid ventricular pacing when a now another uh, kind of we can say variation of this but a diff little different uh, way of doing this is mvp or managed ventricular pacing now what this does is a little different here this algorithm it which is basically present in a dual chamber pacemaker switches the mode of pacing between aai and ddd so what is aai behave like a single chamber atrial pacemaker even though there is a ventricular lead so it's just going to pace the atrium and then allow and the atrial pacing is going to conduct to the ventricle if intrinsic conduction is there but what's going to happen if there is no intrinsic there is no intrinsic conduction in other words if there is no ventricular activation between two atrial activations okay you had one atrial activation then you had another atrial activation and nothing in between which means there was a pause then it immediately provides a backup pulse twice in succession then the device says i'm going to switch to ddd mode so let's see and then if in ddd mode it continues for some time and then instead of extending the av delay what mvp does is it switches to aai for one cycle and if in that one cycle it has intrinsic conduction it goes back to the aai mode and then it keeps going at aai mode till intrinsic conduction fails so we able to understand so here at the left of the tracing device is program mvp and it is operating at the aai it's atrial pacing it is a little long av delay intrinsic ventricular depolarization atrial pacing intrinsic ventricular depolarization it's keeping on going in the ai mode now what happened here on the third beat atrial pacing no conduction okay so the there were the av node failed to conduct for this beat so next atrial pace comes so now the device has had two atrial events no ventricular event in between it immediately gives a backup pulse at a very short av delay but it continues in aai mode as of now next there is a atrial pace again no intrinsic conduction so here again after the next atrial pace 
gives an immediate backup. But now what has happened? The lack of conduction has happened for two successive cycles. And therefore, the device now switches to the DDD mode with the programmed AV delay. So now the device has gone to the DDD mode from the AAI mode. Let's see what happens. Now the device keeps going at the DDD mode and here in beat number four, for a single beat, the device switches back to the AAI mode and then it finds that, okay, I have a intrinsic conduction and therefore the AAI mode. Now suppose here in the single beat, it had not seen the R wave here immediately back to the DDD mode. So remember, to switch from AA to DDD, it needs two missed beats. It needs two successive beats. Okay. So when it is trying to test in the DDD mode, if a single for one side, a single beat, there is no ventricular depolarization, the DDD mode. of these two approaches. In one, in search hysteresis, you are just trying to keep on extending the AV delay and try to look for ventricular depolarization. Whereas in managed ventricular pacing, you are switching between two modes back and forth. So the disadvantage of search AV is that there are how much you can keep extending AV delay. And we talked about this during our timing cycle. The AV delay is an important component of the total atrial refractory period. So if you keep extending the AV delay too much, then you start affecting the other timing cycles and the upper rate behavior of the pacemaker. So you can extend the AV delay only to a particular extent and therefore you are limited by that in terms of looking for the intrinsic conduction. Whereas what MVP is doing is that it is completely switching to the AAI mode. And therefore, even if you have conduction with a very long AV delay, you can still by a particular AV delay. But MVP also has certain disadvantages. It's not like a golden arrow and you have to be watchful in a patient programmed on MVP because what MVP can sometimes end up doing is that it can end up allowing AI pacing at very long AV delays, sometimes even exceeding 400 milliseconds. Now, is it okay to have intrinsic conduction with such very long AV delays? may not really be desirable because if you have an extremely long AV delay, then your next P wave can come pretty early in diastole, limiting ventricular filling. And in some patients, this can give rise to uncomfortable symptoms. And we have seen plenty of examples of this clinically where even in search AV stresses, sometimes we have seen that when you try extremely long delays, the patients are not comfortable. They have uncomfortable palpitations. They come with shortness of breath, dizzy spells, and so forth. Secondly, with allowing such long AV delays, sometimes it allows to pacing into the programming rate. So again, this can give rise to undesirable symptoms in such patients. So when you're having MVP or search AV, be look at the ECG, look at what's going on, and be mindful of the actual AV delays which are happening. And then if the patient is complaining of some symptoms, you have to think about this, whether this long problems. Secondly, another potential issue with them is what you are seeing here. You can see that there was a pause here and then there was a pause again here. Now this happens to successive weeks and it's okay. The device is going to switch to DDD. But imagine if there was and then here the ventricle conducted then again this p wave was drawn and then this p wave got conducted alternate conduction drop conduction drop and the criteria will still not be met for the device to switch back to d to Sometimes the MVP can allow, end up allowing frequent pauses. So I talked about the issue of an alternate beat, but it need not be so quick. It can be every few beats. But if the patient has, say, 
six to seven pauses that make them symptomatic and they can start having some disease spells. So you have to watch practically the way these algorithms are working in a given situation. And then you have to make a clinical decision as to whether the algorithm is actually or whether it's in a given case. So where, where are we facing avoid algorithms especially useful? Now, they really should be on when the patient has been primarily implanted for sinus dysfunction. Now, in sinus node dysfunction, what are the current recommendations? The current recommendations are to implant a dual chamber pacemaker because there is a small risk that conduction system disease can progress and they can develop AV block in the future. But in such a case, you should have ventricular pacing avoidance algorithms programmed because the patient's primary problem is sinus node dysfunction. There is nothing wrong with the AV node. So you don't want to have a short AV delay and unnecessarily pace the ventricle and the patient's AV conduction is actually going pretty okay at this point of time. So that is one place where I, where you should especially remember the switching on of the ventricular pacing avoidance algorithm. And also you should make use of it wherever you clinically feel that there is going to be some degree of intrinsic conduction. Oftentimes it could be a trial and error. You might end up switching it on and then at the next interrogation, you will be able, the device will be able to tell you what percentage of ventricular pacing is going on. And sometimes despite all your algorithms, if you're finding a very high degree of ventricular pacing going on exceeding 90 or 95%, that means that the patient is not really having sufficient amounts of intrinsic conduction. So in such a situation, you can consider putting the algorithm. So this is an ongoing evaluation and decision which you need to all right, so now we are going to go to the next algorithm, which is the automatic mode switch or AMS. Sometimes it's also simply called mode switch. So as the name implies, automatic mode switch means the device is automatically going to switch its pacing mode. And what is the scenario for it to do it? The basic scenario is to, in a dual maker switch from a tracking to a non-tracking mode whenever there is a atrial tachyarrhythmia which is detected. So we know Just that me. in a in a dual in a dual Deep chamber pacemaker. So we know that in a dual chamber pacemaker you need to have tracking from the atrium to the ventricle and you're maintaining AV synchrony. And you want to do this in physiologic limits or physiologic heart rates. But in case the patient has an atrial tachycardia at rates of 150, 160 or 170, you don't want tracking at very high rates. Also, you will have start having undesirable upper rate behavior in physiologic reason. If the patient has appropriate exercise and there is a sinus tachycardia, that is an appropriate increase in the ventricular heart rate. On the other hand, an arrhythmia occurring at rest and suddenly pushing up the heart rate is not a desirable. Therefore, what happens is that in mode switch, the device detects the occurrence of an atrial arrhythmia by the intrinsic signals in the atrium. And then what it does is it switches from a tracking mode to a non-tracking mode such as VVI or DDI. So what does DDI mean? It is going to have pacing and chambers, but there will going to be inhibition in response to same chamber depolarization, but there is going to be a AV delay in response to atrial depolarization. So typically, practically how mode switch works is that the device will essentially go to like at a particular rate which you can program. You can say that if you detect an atrial arrhythmia, please switch to VVI pacing. So switch to VVI pacing at 80 beats, and that's what the device is going to do. And the moment the atrial arrhythmia terminates and the device detects that, it is then going to go back to the tracking mode, the mode. Mode switching. So if you see the upper panel, you can see that 
Here is the, the EGM, which says EGM. You can see this very rapid atrial arrhythmia going on. This is almost like atrial fibrillation. And initially, what was happening was that some of these atrial signals were being detected and the device was, and the ventricle was be, being paced pretty fast. But soon enough, through the atrial electrograms, the device detected that there is an arrhythmia going on. And therefore, you can see the bottom panel that this rapid tracking stopped and the device just switched to pacing the ventricle at a set and programmed rate. And this will keep going in this manner till the atrial arrhythmia terminates and then the device will again switch back to a tracking mode. So whenever you see a programming um, screen, you will see that the device gives you an option. What is the rate threshold you want to set for mode switch to be activated? Is it an atrial rate of 160 or 170 or 180? So this is depending on the clinical situation. You need to find out there can be a specific duration which you can program. And then you are uh, activating the mode switching to happen in those particular circumstances. The challenges to mode switching, it obviously depends on adequately and appropriately sensing the atrial arrhythmia. If there is under sensing of atrial signals, which can because the arrhythmia signals are going to be different from the sinus signals and they can be potentially of a lower amplitude. So sometimes the device can fail to detect the arrhythmia and there'll be a failure of mode switch. Or sometimes if there is some noise or if there is over sensing, there can be unwanted loss of AV synchrony. So this is an example of an inappropriate. We already discussed in a previous session about how the atrial appendage, the right atrial appendage, where the lead is commonly placed actually overlies the RVOT anatomically. And most of the time in a dual chamber pacemaker, if you carefully look at the atrial lead, you will find that there is invariable. And if the sensitivity settings result in the atrial lead actually sensing these ventricular signals, you can see what's happening here. There is atrial pacing going on. And this is actually an example from a CRT tracing where you have biventricular pacing. And then it says AB and AR for signals detected during blanking and refractory periods. Now remember, signals detected during refractory periods typically do not alter pacing cycles, timing cycles, but they are used in diagnosing tachyarrhythmias. And therefore, here, Due to the inappropriate detection of far field ventricular signals, this device inappropriately goes into here. It says AR, AR, and then here it says MS. So the device says, I have detected an atrial arrhythmia. I'm going to mode switch now. So when you see this, you can understand that there is a problem of over. Right. So the next algorithm I want to talk about, which is not so commonly encountered, but some of some models of pacemakers will have it is known as the rate drop response RDR, or sometimes also called sudden bradycardia response SBR. Now this is an algorithm which is particularly useful when you are implanting a pacemaker for the indication of neurocardiogenic or vasovagal syncope. Now there are certain uh, situations where you would implant a a uh, pacemaker for neurocardiogenic syncope if the episodes are very frequent and especially if the response is of a cardioinhibitory type. Now, when you implant a pacemaker primarily for this indication, then the pacemaker needs to do something special to ensure that an episode is aborted. If you think about the pathophysiology of a vasovagal or a neurocardiogenic syncope, especially of the cardioinhibitory type, it is characterized by a sudden and precipitous fall in heart rate. So one moment, the patient can be having a heart rate of 80 or 90, and the next moment it's either 20 or 30. So it's a very precipitous fall in heart rate. Now, if you have a pacemaker working with its routine principle of a lower rate interval, say 60 beats or 50 beats, and it just delivers the pacing at its lower rate interval, this, it turns out, will not be good enough to prevent the 
faint which has been brought on by a sudden hemodynamic compromise so what the rate drop response does is that whenever there is a precipitous heart rate fall like this then it just doesn't pace at the lower rate interval it initiates pacing at a much faster rate either you can set an absolute rate at which you want the spacing to happen or it can be set as a relative percentage of the maximum heart rates which are generally achieved over a period of time so how does the device recognize this it looks at so looks at the time period over which the drop happens so this is an example of how the drop response would work so here the patient was having his own intrinsic heart rate here is the pacemaker which has been programmed to rate 40 bp programmed with such a low lower rate limit because if you are implanting it for a indication of a vasovagal syncope most of the time the patient has his own system he doesn't have conduction system disease so you don't want to keep a high lower rate and unnecessarily pace the ventricle so depending on the indication sometimes you will find that the lower rates are programmed pretty low so the lower rate is programmed at 40 now the patient has a vasovagal episode and the heart rate precipitously drops here and would probably go even below 40 now in a normal pacemaker what is it going to do at this point of time it is just going to pace at 40 now that will not be enough to prevent the symptoms or to prevent the faint but here with the rate drop response programmed on after 3 beats the pacemaker has found out that there has been a precipitous drop of heart rate within a short duration of time and therefore it switches to the intervention rate which is programmed at 100 beats per minute and then it gives that higher pacing for a specified duration of time after which the rate then slowly again drops down and intrinsic rate takes over and this has been found to be much more effective in the symptoms of neurocardiogenic syncope as compared to routine pacing so keep in mind that if a pacemaker is being implanted primarily for neurocardiogenic syncope it may not be enough to implant a routine pacemaker but you may want to implant some kind of a device which incorporates some kind of thing like this. so let's do the things i told but i mode. told in a brief uh, thing so i didn't go in detail it's a very complex algorithm i think some people okay so we'll go to uh, the next algorithm of ventricular safety pacing we'll talk about this briefly because hopefully you'll not encounter it much uh, frequently we mentioned this briefly when we were talking about the pacing cycles now the issue which ventricular safety pacing is designed to tackle is the issue of crosstalk so what is crosstalk it's the inappropriate sensing of the signals of one chamber in the opposite chamber and big instance where the atrial pacing can be potentially detected in the ventricle now if that happens what can happen is there could be a inappropriate inhibition of the ventricular output and in a dependent patient this can sometimes result in a complete lack of pacing and a asystole in a dependent patient and this issue to happen therefore the ventricular channel typically incorporates what is known as a crosstalk sensing window so this graph here is all the periods in the ventricular channel not in the atrial channel so immediately after the atrial pacing if you recall you have a post atrial ventricular blanking and then immediately following that there is a very short period which is known as the crosstalk sensing window so during this period the ventricular channel sensing is open and if it senses something in this crosstalk sensing window then it does something very peculiar what does it do if it senses something in its crosstalk sensing window it then immediately delivers a ventricular spike at an extremely short av delay now why does it 
why is this funny response there now ideally you would say that if something comes in the cross so it must be noise why don't you just ignore it do nothing in which case after av delay is elapsed you just pace the ventricle as usual and therefore you have no danger of pacing inhibition and asystole there is only one potential problem with that when something happens in the cross window the device can't be 100% sure that it is noise it could be intrinsic depolarization with a very short av delay can happen sometimes or it could be pvc now if that is the case then if you are going to have an act event here by the time the av delay elapses this in r wave has occurred and the t wave may be following that and the pacemaker in its slow av delay may be delivering a particular pace on the t wave creating a r on t phenomenon and potential risk of vf so because of this the pacemaker gives this peculiar response when it senses something in its crosstalk sensing window it says i am not sure whether this is noise or this is an intrinsic r wave so at the same time i don't want to wait for the program dv delay to elapse because if there was an actual r wave i might end up pacing on its t wave therefore i will pace the ventricle but i will pace it immediately within a very short duration that way if it was noise i will give ventricular pacing i would have given it at a very short av delay it's okay but i gave ventricular pacing on the other hand if it was an intrinsic r wave my spike will fall on the r itself it will not capture but no harm done so this is the principle as to why the ventricular safety pacing operates so when we see this kind of a tracing you look at the places where the blue dots are and contrast it to the other beats the first beat you can see atrial pacing ventricular pacing after a specified and decent programmed av delay and here you have the atrial pacing followed by pacing at an extremely short absurdly short av delay which nobody will program so when you see this you should immediately suspect that this is ventricular safety pacing and you should find out as to why this is happening the ventricle is sensing something in the crosstalk window now is it because you have programmed the atrial output unnecessarily very high can you potentially reduce the atrial output or is it because you have programmed the ventricular sensitivity too much can you reduce the ventricular sensitivity what can you do to avoid this issue because if it happens once in a while it's okay but if it happens as in this tracing very frequently then it's not a desirable thing to happen so this is as far as ventricular safety pacing is concerned so just out of interest what's happening here if you see the beat number 1 it's okay pace v pace beat number 2 a very funny looking trace and again if you if you analyze logically with the knowledge of the algorithms a lot of these tracings can make sense here you can see there is a p wave and then there is a spike after that and then there is a spike a very within a very short interval so you can make out that the first spike is probably atrial pacing the second spike is ventricular pacing now why did the atrial pacing occur here when there was a p wave so you can then think that most likely there was under sensing of this particular p wave so the pacemaker failed to sense this p wave and ended up giving an atrial pacing spike which did not capture because the atrium is refractory now this pacing spike was then sensed in the crosstalk sensing window of the ventricle which therefore decided to give a safety pacing within a very short duration which fell on the intrinsically conducted r wave resulting in a functional non capture of the ventricle which resulted in ventricular safety pacing is actually atrial under sensing so here you will have to increase the sensitivity of the atrial channel so you have to go through the seek to find out the root cause of the problem so a couple of more algorithms and then we'll be concluding
algorithm we are talking about is those algorithms which are designed to tackle the issue of PMT or pacemaker mediated tachycardia. We talked about pacemaker mediated tachycardia in the last session. Why does this happen? This happens whenever there is a retrograde conduction from the ventricle to the atrium. This can happen after a ventricular pacing event or more commonly it can happen after a PVC where the V event conducts, the ventricle conducts to the atrium, there is a retrograde P wave. This retrograde P wave then gets sensed by the atrial channel. It initiates the AV delay, which paces the ventricle. Again, there is retrograde conduction and then so forth it initiates the endless loop tachycardia, which is known as PMT. Uh, PMT tracing where you can see a running tachycardia which is terminated briefly by a PVC and again another PVC initiates the run of PMT. The anti-grade limb of this tachycardia is atrial tracking by the device. The retrograde limb is native VA conduction. So what are the reasons why PMT can happen? We talked about the PVAR for the post ventricular atrial refractory period if that is inappropriately short then retrograde P waves can be detected. PVCs are a common way of initiating. Some of the other reasons where PMT can be initiated include failure of atrial capture, atrial under sensing or programming of very long AV. So whatever may be the cause, PMT algorithms are designed to recognize PMT once it occurs and perform some intervention automatically to terminate it. So how does the device recognize PMT? It uses two features. Number one, the rate at which the, of course, it has to be a ASVP sequence. That's obvious. It's going to be atrial sensing, ventricular pacing. So number one. Number two, it will be happening close to the upper rate interval, which is the maximum tracking rate of the pacemaker. Number three, there will be a constant and fixed VA interval. So using these three features, the pacemaker can diagnose that what is going on right now is a PMT or a pacemaker mediated tachycardia. And then it can initiate various responses to break this cycle. So what are some of the responses it can do? Number one, it can extend the PVAR for a single beat when tachycardia is going on. So here you can see, you know that the PVAR is the post ventricular atrial refractory period which is designed to prevent the sensing of retrograde P waves by the atrial lead. But here you can see in this PMT, the retrograde P wave is consistently falling out of the PVAR and perpetuating the tachycardia. Now, when the device recognizes that a PMT is going on, it stretches out the PVAR for one particular cycle and then that breaks the PMT and then normal dual number pacing can so here is an example of, uh, you can see that a PVC happened here, initiated a retrograde P wave and a PMT, which kept going on. And then it extended the, and here, basically it extended the PVAR for one duration and then for one beat, and then it broke the PMT. Now, the same thing it can also do just in response to a PVC that is called the P. So here, even before a PMT can start, as soon as the device sensed that a PVC occurred, it extended the PVAR and prevented the sensing of this retrograde PV. That is known as a PVC response. Now, other ways in which a device can break a PMT include if it diagnoses a PMT, suspend atrial tracking for one cycle. So when a P wave comes, don't track it, don't initiate a AV delay, and then the cycle breaks, and then from the next cycle onwards, the dual chamber pacing can take over. The other way would be to give an atrial pacing at a pre-specified duration, so that instead of the retrograde P wave, your atrial pacing atrium and then breaks the tachycardia. So these are the various types of response break the PMT. The last algorithms which I want to talk about relate to the prevention and treatment of atrial arrhythmias. Now, one of the important uses of a pacemaker in addition to pacing is that it is a literally a 
24 hour holter which is available for us because most modern pacemakers are going to give you information about atrial arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias and so forth. Now that is useful diagnostic information. In addition, some of the pacemakers also incorporate certain programmings which can help to try and suppress atrial arrhythmias. So ATAF suppression algorithms. Now, what is the basis for this? Different studies have shown that if you are able to pace the atrium, then it is useful for suppressing atrial arrhythmias in a patient who is prone to them. So obviously you don't want to unnecessarily pace the atrium either in every patient, but tendency for atrial arrhythmias when it has been shown that pacing the atrium and dominating the rhythm can help suppress ectopic atrial foci and initiation of atrial arrhythmias. So this can take various forms. You may choose to program the low rate interval in such a way that you ensure atrial pacing most of the time and therefore try and prevent the onset of atrial arrhythmias. But remember that the rate is going to be quite dynamic in a given patient. And therefore, ATAF suppression algorithms are those which basically continuously monitor the atrial rate and they are able to then adjust the atrial pacing rate to basically overdrive and ensure that most of the time the rhythm is a atrial paced rhythm. Now, a variation of this can be to say that we'll allow intrinsic atrial activation most of the time, but if a PAC is detected or a string of premature atrial contractions are detected, then the device starts pacing at a faster rate in order to try and suppress this, these PACs. So different variations of these ATAF suppression algorithms have been shown to be useful to reduce occurrences of atrial time. So this is one example of how a particular suppression algorithm may work. So here you can see in the top panel that atrial pacing is going on at a particular rate. You can see these little different looking P waves. Now the patient's own atrial rate speeds up and couple of intrinsic P waves are detected. And once the couple of intrinsic P waves are detected, there is a, immediately the device increases its atrial pacing rate and then goes back to forcing atrial pacing. So many of these features are programmable and there will be some different nuances in how different variations of this algorithm work. Um, algorithm which is designed more to treat atrial arrhythmia. So remember ATF suppression algorithms are more about preventing atrial arrhythmias. Now another algorithm which aims to treat atrial arrhythmias is known as reactive ATP. Now here what the device is going to do, it's going to deliver atrial anti-tachycardia pacing to terminate atrial arrhythmias and therefore prevent fast atrial arrhythmias or prevent degeneration into atrial fibrillation. Not only that, in a patient in whom there is atrial fibrillation, that rhythm can also sometimes slow down and get more organized giving an opportunity for ATP to work. Remember, if it's frank atrial fibrillation with an extremely fast and disorganized atrial rhythm, that termination by pace is very difficult or impossible. But many times the rhythm can either start off as an organized atrial arrhythmia or it can switch back to an organized atrial arrhythmia at some point of time where it will be more amenable to termination by ATP. So these algorithms typically look at the change in atrial rate and also the regularity of the atrial rate. By looking at all of these various parameters, it then decides to give ATP. And then the various details of this uh, programming, such as what rate you want the arrhythmia to be detected, for what duration should there be an intervention, how many rounds of ATP should be delivered, all of these can be programmed. And this Reactive ATP again has been so shown in a few studies to be helpful to reduce the duration and the burden of atrial fibrillation. So this is an example of how a reactive ATP can work. 
here is a and, and, I, and I hope some of you are familiar with looking at what we call the uh, um, interval plots like this. These blank dots represent the ventricular rate. These squares represent the atrial rate. And this is the increasing cycle length. So what is here is a shorter cycle length or a much faster rate. So you can see that a very fast atrial arrhythmia is going on. And the device detects that and gives a ATP here at this point of time, but it is not successful. The arrhythmia continues. But after a, some duration, after a few hours, what happens is that the atrial arrhythmia slows down and becomes more organized. Here you can see how the, all the boxes are lining up, showing that they are, the interval is regularized. So the arrhythmia became more regular, and the device now detected that the arrhythmia has become more regularized. It gave another round of ATP. And this time it was able to break the arrhythmia successfully. So this is the principle of one example of how reactive ATP can work. To conclude, we have seen a collection of different types of algorithms, some of which you encounter more commonly. And you have to have a basic knowledge of how these different algorithms work so that number one, you can recognize that an algorithm is working and it's not some kind of weird malfunction of the device. And secondly, you should be able to program it suitably to take the best advantage of each and every algorithm. So thank you and uh, we'll see if there are some questions, we'll take them up. So let me start, try and access the chat window now. Okay, so so there is one question which is not uh, really related to algorithms. That is, what is the effect of septal pacing, and does it reduce the problem caused by RV epical pacing? So there is an unrelated question, but we will uh, take it up. So. Now, to pace the RV, you know that you can either pace, place the lead at the RV apex or you can pace the RV septum. Now, both have been uh, practiced and the concept of RV septal pacing as opposed to epical pacing is that you might have a physiologic activation along the septum as happens with the intrinsic conduction via the his the system. And there are some studies which have shown that RV septal pacing is a little more beneficial in terms of reducing pacing induced cardiomyopathy. Unfortunately, the studies have been pretty mixed with some studies showing some benefit and some other studies showing no benefit. And therefore, you will see that no strong recommendations have come out advocating RV septal pacing over RV epical pacing. Now, most the probable reason for that is that blindly pacing the septum alone is probably not enough to closely mimic intrinsic conduction because ultimately there you are still pacing the RV myocardium. And your pacing, your conduction system is essentially an insulated structure. So if you pace your RV septum, you pace the myocardium there, it doesn't mean that you're going to immediately access the conduction system. So now, we are understanding that even better with the advent of conduction system pacing. Now we have the advent of his bundle pacing and left bundle pacing, with which we are able to understand that what you really need to do is to actually map the conduction system and directly place your lead on the conduction system. And that is when you can achieve truly physiologic capture. Therefore, the, the, if you do septal pacing, you're probably going to have a paced QRS, which is little narrower than epical pacing. But the evidence that it's conclusively superior to RV epical pacing is kind of lacking, or we can say that it's, it's indetermined. There are mixed results in the various studies.
So the next question is related to that. Does his spacing also cause LV dyssynchrony or cardiomyopathy? So we have um, limited data from his spacing so far because we have about probably three to four years worth of data with his bundle pacing so far. And the data so far are pretty encouraging. And there are a couple of studies which show that pacing induced cardiomyopathy and LV dyssynchrony is significantly reduced as compared to classical RV pacing. But we are going to wait for even longer term data to emerge, but hopefully uh, his bundle pacing is going to, uh, I think, have a exciting uh, result in the future. Can noise be a cause for PMT? It depends on what kind of noise you're talking about. So we talked about the various kinds of PMT substrates. And uh, one of the uh, reasons which we said was, for example, atrial undersensing. Now, why will atrial undersensing result in PMT? When an intrinsic heave happens, it's going to be completely ignored by the device and then it's not going to initiate an AV delay, then it's probably going to give a pacing spike, which may not capture because the atrium is refractory. And then after AV delay, it's going to pace the ventricle. Now, by that time, the delay has been really long from the intrinsic P wave and the atrium is then receptive to receive retrograde conduction. And that can therefore result in a PMT response. So, Similarly, if your noise creates some kind of a oversensing and then prevents the actual P wave from being sensed, it could potentially result in a PMT. So it depends on what kind of noise we are talking about and when in the pacemaker cycle, which it is happening. Now, how do we differentiate PMT from sinus tachycardia? So good question because sometimes it can be truly confusing in a clinical uh, scenario because you can have a sinus tachycardia going on with tracking to the ventricle. <clears throat> Important rules I'll, I can give you. Number one, when, whenever you are confused, please take a 12 lead ECG. Now, how are the P waves going to be in the inferior leads? If it's a sinus tachycardia, the P waves are going to be upright because the activation is coming from above. It's coming from the sinus node. Whereas a PMT is the retrograde atrial activation from B to A. Therefore, your P waves are going to be inverted in the inferior leads in 2, 3 and area. Secondly, the PMT will keep running steadily at a rate which is close to the upper tracking rate. So if you're programmed an upper tracking rate of 130 and you're having a tachycardia which is going at like 128 to 130, pretty much staying fixed in that range and showing absolutely no variation, that is again an indicator that it's more likely a PMT rather than a sinus tachycardia. Okay, next question. Can you explain about base rate behavior? Uh, there is really no term called base rate behavior. I don't know if you're talking about um, upper rate behavior. We'll, we'll come back to that. We can talk about upper rate behavior if there is a little bit of uh, time. Can you again explain about the reactive ATP tracing, the last but one slide? Okay, let me quickly go back to that. Okay, I think we... Okay, so this is basically what we call an interval plot. Okay, so what it is doing, it is these black dots are the ventricular RR intervals. These white squares are the AA intervals. Okay, and the interval here is on the y axis. Okay, for example, here it is, let us say, 300 milliseconds, 400, 500, I'm y axis. So if you are higher up here, it means the rate is slower. It's a longer interval. So the RR interval is kind of running with a little variation like this, whereas the AA interval is very fast. And secondly, if you look at it here, the AA interval is all over the place. It's chaotic and irregular. 
So this shows you that the atrial rate is very fast. It's also very irregular, which is probably atrial fibrillation. So the device based on the atrial rate and the regularity, it detected an atrial arrhythmia and it decided to give pacing. Now, it, anti tachycardia pacing is typically delivered at a rate faster than your arrhythmia, right? You want to overdrive. If you pace slower than your arrhythmia, the arrhythmia is just going to continue. You can't capture the chamber. So if the atrial arrhythmia is going at 180 beats per minute, the device will pace the atrium at say 190 beats per minute, briefly overdrive and then abruptly stop the pacing, which can help to sometimes break the arrhythmia and allow the sinus or whatever the atrial pacing, routine atrial pacing to take over again. So typically pacing will look like this, a series of closely bunched spikes. And you can see here that the cycle length drops from beat to beat, it is following a down slope. And this is something known as ramp pacing, where you don't pace at a steady interval, but you keep dropping from one pace to the next, you keep dropping the cycle length. So whenever you see a, a series of bunched beats like this, the device is delivering ATP. And often the device will also annotate it, like here, first ATP, and it's showing you the arrow here. But you see, after the ATP, nothing happened to the atrial rate. It is still continuing fast. It is still continuing very irregular. And then time elapses. And then what happened, automatically here, the atrial rate reduced a little bit. It has gone up from here. It has gone up a little bit. And also you see how much more smooth and organized this is. It has become a more organized atrial arrhythmia. So the device detected that and said, the atrium has become a little more organized now. Let me re-attempt the ATP. And again, here you can see this ramp ATP being delivered here. And see what happens after that. There are a few ectopics here. And then the atrial rate comes here. Much longer cycle length. So the atrial arrhythmia is terminated by the successful ATP therapy. So the recognition of the uh, takes some uh, understanding, but if you kind of, you know, see the most, a lot of devices, especially the tachyarrhythmia devices like um, the ICDs will give you uh, interval plots like this, and then you can, you can learn to analyze them. All right. How can we suppress VPC or bigeminy pattern that is perceived as intrinsic rhythm in relation to an ARVC patient? who is on an ICD, but has continuous bigeminy and low heart rate, though the base rate has been set at 70 per minute with to suppress the PVC, but the heart rate is still low. So basically, they are asking a clinical situation here where a patient has a bigeminal rhythm, right? You might have a paced beat and then followed by a PVC and a pause, a paced beat followed by a PVC and a pause. And this can be quite an irritating rhythm uh, sometimes. Now, unfortunately, uh, there is nothing really as far as the device is concerned, which can reliably suppress a PVC. Uh, because PVCs are essentially an arrhythmic focus and you know they can fire at fixed or random intervals. So maneuvers like just trying to increase the ventricular pacing rate, et cetera, may not really work. Most of the time for PVCs, your intervention has to be either pharmacological, you have to try and see giving beta blockers, antiarrhythmic drugs are helpful to suppress the PVC. And second, or it has to be an intervention such as a catheter ablation to uh, eliminate the focus of the PVC. Now, such intervention should obviously be driven clinically. You, you never look at the cosmetic appearance of an ECG and do that. You have to find out if the PVC is actually causing clinical problems or, if, for example, a patient with a CRT, it is interfering with delivering by V pacing. That's a very common scenario. You can have so frequent PVCs that you do not achieve a sufficient percentage of CRT pacing, and that can be really affecting your CRT response. So if there is an indication like that to go and treat the PVC, then you will have to do that, and, and really the device can't do much about this. All right, so I think we have come to the end of the questions and uh, end of the time also. So 
I think if there are no further questions, we'll conclude today's session. Hopefully, most of you got a reasonable understanding about the commonly encountered um, algorithms. So. Yeah, so thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. And uh, thank you all for attending this session. So we will be concluding our course on uh, 27th of June, Saturday. So please try to join at same time 6.30 and uh, we will be discussing on pacemaker programming and troubleshooting. So thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you and have a good evening, everyone.